So in this chapter, we're going to talk about microorganisms in the body. So how do they get in? What are some sneaky ways on how they get in and cause infection in the body? We're going to talk about how they can get transmitted from one person or one object to another. And something called epidemiology, the tracking. You know, how do they go from one place to another? So we've already talked about how we can grow organisms. What do they need to be happy? We've talked about how we can kill or stop microbial growth. But now we're going to talk about, you know, once they get in the body, how do they get there? How do they take hold? How do they cause what's known as an infection in the body? So this chapter is going to talk about our what's called microbial menagerie of all the organisms that are in your body. You're not alone. What are their portals of entry? How do they get in? What is their pathway once they get in? What are some tricky things they do to try to get in and take hold in the body? What are some of the toxins and enzymes they can make to cause us infection? How they can go from host to host? And then tracking different organisms in the world. So my kind of start on here is you're not alone. So anyone that's feeling lonely, <laughs> you are not alone. You've got several billion organisms living on you and in you right now. So think about that. You know, they, they want you to be happy too. So when we talk about our different organisms, most of them that are on you and in you right now are not pathogens. They're your normal flora. And so we've got lots of organisms that live on you and in you and they themselves can have some protective effect on your body. They can be good for you. They can develop different host systems. They can develop your immune system. The problem is, and the ones we seem to be most concerned about, are the ones that, yes, they can get places they shouldn't, or they can grow out of control, and they can cause disease. So microbes that are hanging out on the body with you pretty much your entire life are called your normal resident microbiota. Other terms that I've seen and heard in different books, in discussions, your indigenous microbiota, your microflora, your normal flora, or your commensals. So I'm like, all different terms. These are organisms that are living on the body, in the body. They live together in different parts of the body. Now, an infection is when you have some type of pathogenic organism something that can cause a disease, that it gets past all of your host defenses, it enters different tissues, and it starts to multiply. That's what hopefully some of our normal microbiota will try to prevent from it happening. But when people talk about an infection is some type of pathogenic disease-causing organism got in and is now taking hold in the body. When we talk about a pathogen, we're talking about the actual organism that can cause an infection. An infectious disease is an infection that disrupts some part of the body, which means you are now suffering from the effects of that particular infection. Now, your resident microbiota, again, you are a habitat for lots of different types of organisms. They live in different parts of the body. There are parts of the body they don't live in. They don't live in various organs, tissues, or fluids, or they shouldn't. But most, uh, I was going to say, the most of the areas, I'm like, we'll talk about where in the body they hang out, but we group our normal microbiota, our organisms that are living with you most of your life, as transient and residents. Your residential microbiota, these are the ones that become established into different parts of the body, and they stick with you pretty much your entire life. Transient microbiota, they hang out in the body, but for short periods of times, and I even put, should put quotations around short, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because it could mean several hours, it could mean several days, it could even mean several years. But short is not not your entire lifetime. And they could be gotten rid of because of washing hands, taking showers. There could be a change in the body, a pH change, a fever, a temperature change. Could somehow make those organisms not happy. Uh, maybe you took a broad-spectrum antibiotic for an infection and got rid of some other organisms along the way. Uh, generally, your resident microbiota generally don't cause disease. We'll talk about sometimes they could. Uh, your transient microbiota that are with you for that short period of time are usually the more likely organisms to cause disease, but not always. So where do you get 
your microorganisms. If they're with you for your entire life, where do you get them? Well, your womb is sterile or exenix. You didn't have them then. You pick up your normal microbiota, your bacteria, and it starts with the birthing process. So just during childbirth, you are picking up organisms that were found on mom. And I'm like, anything that was found in the reproductive tract, in the, the vaginal tract, anything on the skin during nursing or breastfeeding. And I'm like, anytime anyone is touching the baby, breathing on the baby, they are picked up. And I'm like, anytime they're ex that body is exposed to other organisms. And so... I know a lot of times you have parents that are like, I'm going to try to keep my kids sterile. You shouldn't. Those, you know, babies need to pick up their normal microbiota. They need to pick up those organisms because those organisms can do a lot of good. They can actually prevent other organisms, pathogenic organisms, from taking hold. So those first few months, first few years of life, they're picking up all of those microorganisms. And of course I had to throw my kids' pictures somewhere in there. This was several years ago, so they're older now. But I'm okay. Let your kids, you know, play in sand and dirt. Let them pet random animals. Again, the more you expose kids to different organisms, the more likely they're going to pick up some of those normal good bacteria that are going to be with them for their entire life. Does it put you at risk of picking up other organisms? Yes. But the more normal flora that you can establish in your body that are good bacteria the more, you know, the stronger their immune responses are going to be. Now, this is showing just some examples of organisms that are with you right now. So in your upper respiratory tract, you've got a whole bunch of these guys. So lots of different organisms. Your upper digestive tract, you've got a whole bunch of these guys. Your lower digestive tract, you've got these guys living there. Sometimes they're the same. But there is a difference in environment between your upper and lower digestive tract, so there are some different organisms. In the female reproductive tract and the urinary tract, you've got these guys. In the male, you've got these. Some of them are the same female versus male, but again, different environments, and so that can lead to different organisms living there. And in the eyes and in the skin, you've got a whole bunch of these guys living there. So again, when I said you're never alone, you're never alone. You have lots of different organisms living on in, in you right now. And again, normal flora. These are normal. They are supposed to be there. Now, the skin is the largest and most accessible organ. It's anything you touch. And I'm like, you're exposing organisms to your skin. And so there are, again, two groups of normal flora organisms. The transients that are... You know, there for a short period of time in the residence that are pretty much there every day, all day long. The transients usually are only there for a short period of time. They're influenced by hygiene. How often do you wash your hands? How often do you shower? They're more likely to get washed off. Your residents can withstand that, even hand washing, and hang out there. It's why even when you wash your hands, your hands aren't sterile. You remove a lot of possible pathogenic organism, which is why we wash our hands, but your normal flora is still there. And so your hands are never sterile. It's the main reason why when you're working with an open wound, you wear gloves because you can sterilize a glove. You can't sterilize your fingers and your hands. Other microorganisms found in the digestive tract. Again, your digestive tract is exposed to the environment. Anything that's outside that you eat, that's, you know, that you touch, that goes in the mouth, and I'm like, can end up in your digestive tract. And there's a lot of different parts of the digestive tract. There's the, the oral cavity itself. There's the, di the large intestine. And they, in the rectum, they harbor the largest number of different organisms found in the digestive tract. Your mouth, again, has lots of different organisms. Lots of different organisms. You think about everything you eat. The five second rule doesn't work. I mean, if something falls on the floor, it's you're going to pick up something and it can end up in the mouth. But again, sometimes they're just adding to your normal flora. You have lots of different little areas for microorganisms to survive in your mouth. Your cheek, your the gingiva around your teeth, your tongue, underneath, you know, the bottom part of your mouth, your tooth enamel. Lots of different areas that an organism can find a home. Now, your saliva, again, is going to have a lot of organisms in it. It's, you know, five times 10 to the ninth power number of bacteria per milliliter of saliva. It's a lot of bacteria. 
And again, lots of normal flora. However, there are some that, especially the anaerobic bacteria, that if they get in that crevice around the teeth down below the gingiva, down below the gum lines, those are some of the bacteria that can cause your cavities as well as other infections. So most of them are good, but sometimes you get some kind of bad bacteria in there that can cause damage. Your large intestine though, holy cow, you got a lot of bacteria in your large intestine. 10 to the eighth or even to 10 to the 11th microorganisms per gram of feces. If you didn't realize that anytime you poop, over 30% of poop is bacteria. So just think about it. It's a lot of bacteria. Again, you are feeding them. They are growing. They are multiplying every day, every hour, every minute, every second right now. Your bacteria are reproducing. Now, your intestinal tract provides an anaerobic environment for bacteria. So it's where we find some anaerobic organisms. Now, that you know, it's just a different environment. So you're going to have different organisms living in your intestine than, than you do in your mouth or your skin. Now, that also means there are a lot of anaerobic bacteria that can be pathogens as well that can cause infections, but you have some normal anaerobic organisms as well. But those bacteria in your intestinal tract, 10 to the you know, 10th power, Mike, they can do some good things. They have digestive enzymes. They can help break down food. They can produce various vitamins like vitamin B, vitamin K, uh, they can also produce various types of acids. Now, my note is your intestinal bacteria, as they break down waste products, they can also contribute to intestinal odor. If you ever wondered why your farts stink, it's the bacteria. And if you ever wondered why they can smell different, well, that's also the bacteria and what you feed them. And like, depending on what you feed your bacteria, depending on what you eat, can make a difference on the smell that's produced in the fermentation of those different products that you ate. Now, we'd like to maintain our normal flora. Again, they can do great things for us. And they prevent infections because, again, there's only so much food, there's only so much room. They, you know, they want to stay there. They don't want any other organisms, any other bacteria, any other microorganisms taking hold. So we want to keep them happy because they provide that what's called microbial antagonism, is if any other possible pathogenic bacteria wants to take claim to your intestines or in your mouth or on your skin, they're there first and they're gonna provide kind of that battle for the space and for the resources. Again, they don't always win. And yes, you can have infections, but they're there to try to prevent new organisms from growing in their spot. Now, if we take an antibiotic, you might kill some of your normal flora. Certain types of dietary change foods can sometimes damage your normal microbiota. And even different diseases might alter some type of your normal flora. And so again, we wanna try to keep them there. And so if you've probably heard it's all over the news, advertisements, things like that are probiotics. Probiotics, pro means good, bio means life. So these are good living organisms. These are some of the normal flora bacteria that do good things for us, especially in our intestinal tract. So when we talk about, ah, we want, we want probiotics, we do. And I'm like, I'm like, we want things to try to encourage probiotics to survive. So we try to feed them certain nutrients. So we, we talk about different, there are different drugs, there are different types of over-the-counter medicines that are there to encourage probiotics. Yeah, there are nutrients for probiotics. It is the number one reason why when, yes, you take an antibiotic, they do encourage you to eat yogurt because there are probiotics in yogurt. Now, Activia, Activia, it touts in its advertisements, the Activia yogurt, that there are a billion probiotics in every cup of yogurt. It's like, oh, yay, probiotics, yay. Well, what that means is a billion bacteria, but they're good bacteria. It's just people don't like to think that they're eating bacteria and generally bacteria get a negative connotation but if we call them something fancy like a probiotic oh well, that's good so just think about the next time you're eating yogurt you are eating bacteria but you're eating good bacteria now some organisms are more likely to cause disease 
We call them true pathogens. A pathogen is going to cause a disease in even the healthiest person. So it doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter how strong your immune system is. These can cause disease even in the healthiest individuals. And a couple examples there. The, the flu, it doesn't matter how healthy you are. And I'm like, you can still get the flu. And I'm like, the bacteria that causes the plague, malaria. And I'm like, even in the healthiest individuals, can, it can cause disease. And opportunistic pathogens, these are organisms that cause disease sometimes if you're immunocompromised. I'm like, if you don't have a working immune system, they can cause disease. Some of your normal flora, though, however, can be considered opportunistic pathogens. Now, again, your normal flora generally don't cause disease. They're good. However, a normal flora bacteria or organism can become, become, become an opportunistic pathogen if they get somewhere they're not supposed to. So they grow in a part of the body that's not natural to them. An example of that, you have lots of bacteria in your intestinal tract that do good things. One bacteria found in your intestinal tract that does good things is E. coli. Now, E. coli always gets a bad rap. There are different strains of E. coli, some good, and yes, some bad. So you have good strains of E. coli in your intestinal tract, helping break down foods, helping give you vitamins. However, if E. coli goes from your intestinal tract to your urinary tract, you now have a UTI or a urinary tract infection. That's because that normal flora bacteria got into a part of the body that's not natural to them. And so it's possible that they can cause disease, but normally they don't. Now, things that can help them cause disease, any organism, true pathogens, opportunistic pathogens, things that can help organisms cause disease are what is known as virulence factor. It's some characteristic, some structure that encourages them or helps them cause disease. Um, some different examples, and we're going to go through some coming up, but if it has a capsule, if a bacteria has a capsule, that means it can hide itself from our immune system. It slows down or prevents phagocytosis. That's something that allows them or makes them more likely to be able to cause disease. That's a virulence factor. If it can produce some type of toxin, some type of enzyme, um, allow it to stick to surfaces better. Those are all good things for it, which means it's more likely it's able to cause disease. Now, for an organism to cause disease, it has to be able to do three things. It has to be able to get in the body. It has to get past our external defenses. It then has to become established in the body. It needs to find a home. And then once it finds it home, it needs to start to multiply, which means it is now established in the body. It's going to cause an infection. So the how it gets in. Now, we, cause, we call what the how it gets in portals of entry. And some of the top portals of entry is, one, if they can get past our skin. Now, our skin is great at preventing organisms from getting in. However, if you get a nick, a cut, a scratch, anything, you now have an opening for something to get in. Your GI tract, anytime you eat something, drink something, that allows organisms to get into the body that way. Your respiratory tract, anytime I'm like you are breathing through your mouth, we can get things in. Anytime you are just breathing through your nose, things from getting in. And because anytime you are breathing something in, whether through the nose or through the mouth, and I'm like, your, your respiratory tract really is the number one way that organisms, potential pathogenic organisms, get in through the body. Because your skin doesn't always have lots of nicks or abrasions or punctures. And food and drink, a lot of microorganisms are killed in the stomach where it has that low pH. But your respiratory tract, really easy way for things to get in the body. Um, your urogenital tract, it can get in through sexual intercourse. There's lots of sexually transmitted diseases. And some things can cross the placental barrier. Again, the placental barrier is really effective. Generally, things that affect mom don't affect a baby. But there are some things that can cross that placental barrier. It's got an acronym. Everything has an acronym called STORK. And I'm like, it's the syphilis, toxoplasma, other diseases like hepatitis, AIDS, chlamydia, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex virus. Those are things that can cross the placental barrier. And when we get into various types of bacteria and viruses, we'll talk more about those. Now, if it gets in, it also, you also need 
a specific number of organisms to get in. It's called your infectious dose. It's the minimum number of microorganisms that's required for infection to proceed. For a lot of organisms, just getting one or two bacteria in the body doesn't it's not enough to cause an infection. Your immune system would recognize it and get rid of it so fast that it would never cause disease. But if you get enough of a particular organism in the body, it can cause disease. Now, different organisms have different numbers of infectious doses. There are a few organisms out there that their infectious, do infectious do dose is one, that just one needs to get in the body and it will cause disease. Others, you need millions of organisms to get in the body. So it varies among different organisms. It can also vary among the health of the immune system. If you're someone that's healthier, you're going to need higher infectious doses. Now, again, we've got to get past that external defense. We've got to get in. But the second part is you got to stick. you got to find a home and you got to stick to the home. And so a lot of organisms have different types of adhesion factors. It's anything that allows them to stick. Fimbri are sticky adhesions on the outside of cell. Flagella can help them get somewhere, but flagella can actually help them stick. A glycocalyx, that would be usually some type of carbohydrate, sticky outside surface, like a capsule, um, whether it's even the slime layer. Um, they can use different types of proteins, cilia. Some even have cool things like big, huge suckers. This is Giardia. It has a big adhesive disc to attach itself to our intestinal wall. Some things have hooks or barbs. I mean, it's anything that allows these organisms to stick somewhere in the body because they got to stick before they can start to grow. Now, another thing that helps them kind of stick and get in the body is that some of these organisms produce enzymes. And some of these enzymes can actually break apart the structures that hold cells together, which, if they can do that, they have that entry into the body. These would be virulence factors. The fact that they, if they can make these specific enzymes or toxins, like it allows them to more likely cause disease. This is showing a bacteria that's making a toxin. I'm like, the toxin is going to start to damage some of the cell, which causes the cells to slough off, which, if the cells aren't there, it provides bacteria now a way in. And I'm like, some bacteria block our phagocytic response. Our phagocytes, their job means, the phagocyte means an eating cell, it's to eat any foreign invaders. But some organisms, their virulence factor is that they can stop phagocytosis from happening. And if they don't get eaten, they can go anywhere and establish themselves and do what they do best, re reproduction. Some have more unique factors. Uh, salmonella will stick to microvilli in your intestinal tract. And I'm like, actually damage the microvilli, call and cause the cell membrane to actually go around and envelop and bring the bacteria in, where it then can start to reproduce. And so I'm like, it gets inside the cell. It actually encourages the cell to eat it. And then it doesn't get broken down, and it's going to reproduce and cause disease. Now, some more of the toxins, because yes, some can cause cells to slough off, but there are two groups of toxins that bacteria can make. One is called an endotoxin, and the other is an exotoxin. Now, endo means inside. So these are not secreted out from the cell. Instead, these toxins are released when the cell itself is broken down or damaged. We find endotoxins in gram-negative cell walls. Oh my, that, that's the toxin in that outer membrane of a gram-negative cell wall, your lipid A, that when gram-negative bacteria are broken down, that toxin is released and it can cause some serious side effects. It causes a lot of the symptoms of disease, the fever, the inflammation. An exotoxin is a toxin that is secreted out from the cell. It could be one that, yes, could cause the sloughing off of cells, but it could also cause damage enough to the cell that bacteria can get past the cells. They can get inside of those dead cell areas. Now, both of these toxins can cause an, uh, a condition known as toxemia. Anything that has that eme in it, like heme, means something with blood. So toxemia is a condition of toxins in the blood. And once toxins get in the blood, they can go anywhere in the body and they can cause damage, damage to cells in the body, which can cause a lot as well of the symptoms of the disease of that organism. Now there are 
five, depending on the book. Your book has four um, stages of infectious disease. And so I'm like, your book has four, other books say five, and it depends on how they group them together. But there are several stages of infectious disease. So if something gets in and establishes itself and can cause disease, there are stages of infectious disease. You've probably felt all of these at some point. Now, the first thing, when an organism gets in the body, it goes through what's known as an incubation period. There are no signs and symptoms. You didn't even know that you just breathed in, ate something that had some type of uh, infectious organism. And so I'm like, it's because that organism is just still finding itself a home. It's time to break down food sources. It's starting to reproduce, but you don't have any signs or symptoms yet that you are now har harboring something. The next stage is what's known as the prodromal period. It's when you're just starting to feel the effects that there's something in the body that's not supposed to. And so this is like if you wake up one day and you're like, you know, I'm feeling a little off. I feel like I'm coming down with something. You're not super sick yet, but you feel like you're coming down with something. That's the prodromal period. My, the microorganism has taken hold and it's starting to reproduce. And so the numbers of microorganisms are going up. Then we have what's known as the illness stage. The illness stage is when you're going to have the most severe signs and symptoms. Now, Mike, you're going to have the strongest fever, the most body aches. You're going to have the strongest, strongest signs and symptoms of the disease. And I'm like, in your book, they call the illness stage your period of invasion. And I'm like, it's when those microorganisms are everywhere where they're trying to get. It's the height of your infection. You have the highest number of organisms. The next stage, I went the wrong way, and I'm like, is the decline and then convalescence. Your book groups the two together and just calls it a convalescence. It is this stage that the number of microorganisms is going down you're gonna start to feel a little better. Your fever might go down. Instead of having 103, now it's only you know 99 or 100. And I'm like, you don't have as bad of body aches. You're still sick, you still have lots of organisms in your body, but the number is going down. And I'm like, so you're starting to feel better. And you can actually go into what's known as the, con the full convalescence stage. So when you don't have any signs and symptoms, now, that doesn't mean you don't still have a few virus, a few bacteria in your body, and you could still be spreading them even though you're feeling fine. And I'm like, you got to make sure. That's why they say, you know, even with COVID, you know, you, you know, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Well, you might be feeling better by day seven, but you could still be in that convalescent stage where you could be spreading it still, even if you're feeling better. Now, we classify infections different. It's like, oh, yes, you're infected but there's different kinds of infections. A localized infection means that organism is, stays in one, specific, one specific part of the body and it doesn't go anywhere else. If you have an infection in your finger, you got a cut, got infected, as long as that organism stays there in your finger, it's a localized infection. That would be a good infection. I mean, it stays one spot. A systemic infection means it spreads throughout their, you know, the different parts of the body. It usually means it got into some type of fluid in the body, usually the bloodstream, and it can travel. That's when you can run into a lot of issues, when different organisms travel throughout the body. A focal infection is when the, that agent breaks loose from your localized infection and goes to other tissues. A focal infection can become a systemic infection. And so an example of focal infection is if you had an infection in your finger and for some reason it was able to get into the bloodstream and it goes to a systemic infection, then we call it a focal infection. A mixed infection is when you've got several microorganisms all growing in the same infection site. So yes, if you have an open wound and you touch the floor, which is always really dirty, you probably are going to have a mixed infection. It's not just one organism that's in there. It's a whole bunch of organisms that got in there. Now, the first infection, the initial infection is always called the primary infection. However, you can also develop something known as a secondary infection. This happens a lot with the flu virus, is that you picked up the flu virus. That's your initial infection. But because the flu virus damages your respiratory membrane, which is the first line of defense. So many things get into the respiratory tract. 
that while you're sick with the flu, you are more likely to pick up other organisms and have other infections. Those would be then be secondary infections. An acute infection, it comes on rapidly, it's severe, but it's short-lived. So when someone says, oh, I had the 24-hour flu, that would be an acute infection. You were really sick for 24 hours, then you were feeling better. A chronic infection means it persists for a long period of time. And I'm like, it takes a long period of time for the body to eventually get rid of something. This can happen with some of the pneumonia bacteria, that it could take six months or more before the body, as well as different drugs, can finally get rid of some type of organism. This is just showing an example of some of those localized, stays in one spot, systemic, spreads throughout the body, focal, it was in one spot and then traveled throughout the body, mixed, got lots of organisms going on, Primary infection, if maybe you had some type of bacteria, maybe you killed it with an anti antibacterial agent, and then you ended up with some other type of organism taking hold, um, you've got a secondary infection. Now, when we try to diagnose some type of infection or disease, usually when you go to the doctor, they want to know what are your signs and symptoms. But those two words are different from each other. A sign is an objective evidence of disease. A symptom is a subjective evidence of disease. Now, an objective means this is something you can see or you can measure. A symptom is something that is felt by the patient. You can't measure it and you as a doctor, nurse, you can't see it. So some examples of signs, things you can see or measure, fever, chest sounds, skin eruptions, you could see white blood cell counts. You could see or feel swollen lymph nodes. You can see an abscess. You can determine heart rate. You can even measure antibodies. I'm like, these are all things you can see and measure. Symptoms, these are all things felt by the patient that you can't see. And I'm like, they could be having chills. You outright can't see that. Maybe you see them shivering, but you don't see the chills part. And I'm like, you can't see pain. You can't see that they're feeling nauseous. You can't see that they are fatigued. I mean, yes, there are some outward symptoms sometimes of fatigue, but you can't see fatigue. You can't see chest tightness. You can't see itching unless you see them physically itching. You can't see headache or weakness. And I'm like, so there are certain things you can't see. Now everyone's like, oh, but sore throat, you can see that. Uh, you can't see a sore throat, but you can see evidence of inflammation. But not all sore throat has inflammation. Now, generally... One of the top things we are looking for, signs and symptoms, is inflammation. And I'm like, generally inflammation is because you have, it, it's an immune system response, and it's because you have a foreign invader in the body. So some of the signs and symptoms that you have inflammation, you're going to have a fever, because you've got increase in body temperature, pain, soreness, and swelling. The swelling is from edema that when your blood vessels dilate, which can cause that warm to the touch uh, on the skin, when the blood vessels dilate, fluid can leak out of the blood vessels. And so now you have accumulation of fluid in tissues. And so you have swelling along with that heat. Sometimes you can have abscesses. This is different inflammatory cells as well as the microbes in one specific area. And you can also have the, the swollen lymph nodes. It's the reason why they're always feeling your lymph nodes. Your lymph nodes is because your immune system is working and they are trapping some type of organism that's got in the body. Now, other signs of infection in the blood. There's a, no, there is a reason why if they don't always know right away what's wrong with you, first thing they're gonna do is let's draw some blood. It's because they're going to look for white blood cell counts. They're going to look for organisms that might have gotten into your bloodstream. Hopefully not. It's never good to have organisms in your bloodstream. But they're going to look for an increase in white blood cells. They're going to look for a decrease in white blood cells. Anything with the word Luke, Luke, mean, Luke means white. And so anything that has Luke in it is they're looking for white blood cell counts. Because white blood cell counts, especially depending on which white blood cell, can clue us in a little bit what's going on. They're also going to look to see if there is any bacteria or viruses in the blood. And so they're going to look at bacteremia. Again, anything that has eme means in the blood. Bacteremia, if you have bacteria in the blood. Viremia, viruses in the blood. It doesn't mean that they are multiplying, but 
it means they're present and they could be getting to different parts of the body causing various infections wherever they go. Now, we do run into the problem though, is there are some infections that go unnoticed. That someone breathed on you and you picked up an infection, but you're asymptomatic. It's also called subclinical, means there's no clinical diagnosis. Is you don't have any symptoms. Which, it's like, yay, I'm sick, but I have no symptoms. I don't have any fever. I don't have swollen lymph nodes, no body aches. Don't go to the doctor. Why would you? You don't have any signs and symptoms. But this can actually be an issue. If you don't have any signs and symptoms, you have no idea you're harboring this particular organism, which means you could be spreading it. Now, I put this picture on the bottom because, yes, this is a big issue with COVID-19 right now, is there are asymptomatic individuals that have no idea that the virus is in the body and they're spreading the virus. It's because you can quarantine people that are symptomatic. And I'm like, in, if you're not symptomatic or you have, you know, you're not infected, we're not worried about you. But there's a group of individuals that have no symptoms or no symptoms yet that are still contagious and still spreading the disease without knowing. And so I'm like, asymptomatic infections can be a real problem. It's because we can't treat them and we can't isolate them, and so they're spreading it unknowingly. Now, we talked about different ways that organisms can get in the body, but there's also a bunch of different ways that organisms can get out of the body. And a lot of them are the same way they got in is the respiratory tract, your salivary glands, that there are viruses commonly found that end up in salivary glands. It's a portal of exit. That's why there's a lot of things spread through saliva. Um, so kissing can spread different organisms. Uh, your epithelial cells, that sometimes some things can leave through the skin. Uh, your feces has a lot of organisms in it. We already talked about a lot normal flora, but not all of them your reproductive tract, your urinary tract, um, and blood. So bleeding can also be a portal of exit. So lots of different ways that organisms can leave the body, which then can be now an infectious agent for something else. Now, talking about different organisms out there, there, you know, I'm like, and then in, well, in the body, but we do have what's known as a latency period for organisms. There are some organisms that you can pick up and your body seems to get rid of, but they're not fully gone. They can actually come by, back and cause disease again. The number one example, because we'll get to it when we get into viruses, is the herpes viruses. There's a lot of herpes viruses out there, more than you think. And a lot of the herpes viruses can go what we just call as dormant or latent is that after the initial symptoms, they seem to go away, but then they can periodically become active and produce the same disease. This is what happens with cold sores, is that that virus is there, it's active, you have a cold sore, cold sore goes away, it's gone latent, but the virus is still in the body, and it can become reactivated, and you have cold sores again. Now, a chronic carrier is someone that has a latent infection that is spreading it, and that happens with herpes. Anytime you have an active cold sore, that virus leaves through that cold sore and you are possibly spreading that virus to anyone that touches that cold sore. Now, what can happen though, especially in these long-term chronic diseases, not generally with the herpes virus that causes cold sores, sometime they, sometimes different organisms can cause long-term or permanent damage. So having an organism that hangs out in the body for a long period of time can eventually cause some serious issues. Uh, we'll talk about some as we get into viruses and bacteria, but, you know, they can cause damage to heart muscles. They can cause damage to skeletal muscles. Polio caused damage to skeletal muscle that showed up years later. It's the post-polio syndrome. And so I'm like, it, the sequelae is, what is that long-term damage to different tissues from having a particular organism? Now, the people that are tracking all of this, you know, how are things spreading? How are they getting in the body? How is it causing disease? Where is it going? Are epidemiologists. Epidemiology is studying the frequency and distribution of diseases in the human population. So if you're an epidemiologist, you probably work for the CDC, and you're the one that's tracking different diseases. You're looking to see how they're spread. And then, then how can you slow the spread or stop the spread? 
They're going to be looking at what are the reservoirs of these different organisms? Where do we find these organisms out there? Are they found only in humans? Are they found only in animals? Are these different organisms found in soil, in water, in different plants? And I'm like, you know, what, what is the source of these organisms? Like, how, how do they get there? Anytime someone gets infected from something, you know, they have an infection, they want to know, well, what was the source? Where did it, where did it come from? Was it another individual? Was it an object? Where did that infection actually come from? Now, if you're the person that's harboring the organism, because you as a human can be the carrier, you can be a human carrier, you can be the reservoir. And I'm like, we group human carriers into two groups, asymptomatic carriers and passive carriers. Now, the ones to be worried about are the asymptomatic carriers. These are the ones that harbor a particular organism and they have no idea. They're completely asymptomatic. The passive carriers, these are ones that we can see signs and symptoms and we can isolate them. Mike, you can look around um, if you walk into somewhere where there's lots of people. Not a lot of that these days. But if you walk into an area and you can see someone is, you know, runny nose, they're coughing, they're sneezing, they look sick, you can avoid them. And so that can decrease your chance of picking up whatever they have. However, asymptomatic carriers, they don't, sh they don't show any symptoms, so you don't avoid them, and you can pick something up. Now, animals can be a big reservoir, a big one. Lots of different types of animals. Now, it's a live animal, or we call them vectors. It's a live animal other than a human that transmits an infectious agent. And we group vectors into arthropods, insects, and then larger animals. And we then group all of those different vectors into what we call as biological vectors and mechanical vectors. A biological vector means that particular bacteria or virus or some other protozoan is part of that organism. It's in the organism and it participates in, you know, the organism participates as part of the life cycle. Like the organism has to get into a certain animal or insect for it to continue to grow before it can get passed on to us. So it's part of the organism. A mechanical vector means it's not necessarily part of the life cycle. It's that vector just carries the organism, sometimes just on its outer surface. It, you know, the organism is not growing, it's not developing, it's just being carried. My example for a mechanical vector is when a fly lands on your food, which this happens in the summer, fly lands on your food. Well, where was it before it landed on your food? It may have been on a pile of poop. And when it landed on that pile of poop, some of that fecal matter and bacteria got picked up on its feet and now it just landed on your food and it just brought some of that fecal matter and bacteria with and dropped it on your food. And so that bacteria was not part of that fly. Instead, the fly was just a mechanical vector. It just carried the organism. Now, and I'm like, anytime something can go from some type of animal, any type of animal, to a human, we call it a zoonotic disease. There are over 150 zoonotic diseases. Now, I like to think zoo, I would hope you were thinking animals when you hear the word zoo. And so a zoonotic disease just means it goes from animal to human. Now, it is impossible to eradicate the disease without eradicating the animal reservoir, which means it's really impossible to eradicate these diseases. An example, rabies. Rabies is commonly found in raccoons and in skunks and in bats out in the wild. If we were going to try to eradicate rabies, we'd have to capture and kill every possible bat skunk fox out there that might be harboring the, the virus. I'm like, one, you'd never be able to capture all of them. So it's impossible to eradicate these different diseases. This is showing some of the examples of viruses and bacteria and other organisms and their animal reservoirs that, yes, lots of viruses come from different animals. Lots of bacteria come from different animals. And some of these, yes, are definitely found around here. A lot aren't. Um, more examples of different bacteria and some other organisms that we can get from different animals. Again, lots of zoonotic diseases out there. Now, diseases that can get transmitted from one human to another human are called communicable diseases. 
So it can go from one host to another host. It means it's contagious. If I have the flu and I coughed on you and you now have the flu, that's because the flu is a communicable disease. It can go from host to host. A non-communicable disease means it can't go from host to host. It comes from somewhere else. Now, it could mean it comes from your normal flora that got a little out of control, but they go from host to, you know, they, they can't go from host to host. This can happen sometimes with acne. And I'm like, acne is usually a bacteria that was part of your normal flora in your skin that got a little out of control in your glands and now causes that acne infection. Um, it's not spreadable. And I'm like, it's just your normal flora that got a little crazy. Now, different ways things can go from host to host. It doesn't always have to be direct contact. So communicable diseases can be spread direct contact, but they can also be spread indirect. So a direct contact, I mean, literally physical contact. Maybe it's um, kissing, touching skin, handshakes, um, sexual intercourse, even fine aerosol droplets, just you know, right away sneezing in someone's face or coughing right in their face. I'm like, that's direct contact. Indirect contact means it can go from host to host, but it needs some intermediate object. And so an example, a vehicle can be used as that inanimate object. So it could be food, as you coughed or sneezed on food and then someone else ate it. And I'm like, or water can be used as a carrier of different bacteria or different pathogens. Biological products, this could be different fluids um, or fomites. A fomite is just any, in, any inanimate object that harbors and transmits a pathogen. A really common example of a fomite, an inanimate object, is your a door handle. Is that someone sneezed in their hand, some, they touched the door handle with that hand, and then you touch the door handle. That door handle becomes that fomite, that inanimate object that harbors and transmits a pathogen to someone else. And I'm like, so any type, you know, anytime you're touching anything, door handles that other people are touching, door handles, um, tables, chairs, things like that, those are inanimate objects inanimate objects that could be harboring diseases. And then there are things that are airborne. And so these are usually, you know, aerosols that travel for usually a farther period of time. This is not someone coughing or sneezing in your face. And I'm like, but there are pathogens out there in the air. And I'm like, you can get mold in air conditioning units and it travels airborne through an entire building. So there are some things that can get in the air and travel around. This is showing how communicable diseases can be acquired. Again, some is through direct transmission, some are through indirect, you know, touching those inanimate objects or using some type of animal to transmit waste from one place or one person to another. Now, we talked a little bit about epidemiology, is studying the transmission sequence. But an epidemiologist, yes, they are constantly looking at what are virulence factors that make things likely to cause disease. What are the portals of entry and exits of various diseases? Because um, they want to know how it's spreading and then how can they stop the slow the spread. They're also doing a constant surveillance. They're looking all the time at what are the rates of occurrence. They're looking at mortality rates, morbidity rates. What are the transmission sequences? Now, the top individuals that are constantly doing this for us in the United States, it's our CDC found in Georgia. And I'm like, and yes, they've been in the news a lot because we're relying on them a lot right now in the United States for tracking COVID-19. And I'm like, they're constantly looking and collecting data is where is the virus? How is it spreading? How is it transmitting? Where are the highest cases? Um, now, the CDC is a United States organization. However, the World Health Organization is a combined effort worldwide. So the CDC will take all of the United States information and share it with the World Health Organization. Other countries are sharing their information with the World Health Organization, and it helps us track pandemics that are worldwide organisms. Now, one thing they are looking at when they're tracking organism is what is its prevalence? That is the total number of cases in a population. It's how many people out there have a particular disease. I like to use the example of HIV. You know, how many people in the world or in the United States, if we want to narrow it down, have 
HIV. That's its prevalence. We can say, you know, oh, 5% of the population has HIV. It's lower than that, but we're going to give it a percentage. An incidence is what's the number of new cases over a, a particular period of time. I don't want to just know how many people have HIV in the United States. I want to know how many new people contracted HIV in the past year. And so over a certain time period, what are the number of new cases? That can help us track to see, you know, what's happening. Are the number of new cases going up or going down? They also look at what is the mortality rate. It's the number of deaths due to a certain disease. And they want to know the morbid morbidity rate. What are the number of people that have a certain disease that are inflicted with a particular disease? It's called also the morbidity rate. It's kind of like prevalence. And I'm like, but we want usually a specific number, not a percentage. Now, when we talk about different diseases, especially if we're looking to see where we track them, we have what we call as an endemic occurrence. An endemic occurrence means this is a disease that has a steady frequency over a long period of time in a particular area. It means a disease that's found somewhere. And I'm like, the flu is endemic to the United States. I mean, everywhere, the flu is everywhere. You can't avoid it. And so a disease that's found normally in an area is an endemic disease. A sporadic occurrence is when you have a bunch of cases at random times that kind of just pop up. And those are usually things that the CDC is going to study. Like, why did that happen? Where did they come from? So this is just showing that Valley Fever, we've got cases all over the United States, anywhere in the blue. We find this particular organism that causes this uh, fever. However, and I'm like, they are showing that, yes, most outbreaks take place in southern United States. Typhoid fever, and I'm like, it's not found in the United States, but we do occasionally get some sporadic occurrences that all of a sudden there seems to be kind of just, you know, a little outbreak for some reason, and, you know, they're going to take a look at it and find out why. Was it something they all ate? Was it, you know, somewhere they all traveled together? Not sure. An epidemic is when a normal disease is now increasing or spreading when it didn't used to be. It's not spreading worldwide, but it means all of a sudden you have a higher frequency of, of a particular organism. I'm like, the flu is an endemic virus. It's everywhere. But if all of a sudden we had a really large number of people getting the flu, higher than normal, we would consider that an epidemic. And I'm like, it's the prevalence of disease is increasing beyond what it was expected to. A pandemic is when that epidemic spreads across continents. Now, an example of a pandemic that your book gives is AIDS. However, in the news these days, the better known pandemic that we are now experiencing, which of course is so new, it's not in any textbook yet, is COVID-19. It is spreading. It is on every continent. Oh, I shouldn't say Antarctica. I don't know if it's in Antarctica yet. Um, but it's everywhere. It's spreading from to different continents. And so it's considered a pandemic. Now, diseases. We're again talking a lot about diseases. There are a group of diseases that are called nosocomial infections, but they are trying to slowly rename them and call them healthcare-associated infections. Mostly because the word nosocomial, no one has any idea what that word means. And so now if we call them a healthcare-associated infection, that tells you a little bit more about what they are. Now, a healthcare-associated infection is a disease that's acquired or developed during a hospital stay. This could mean anyone that goes in for any kind of surgical procedure, any kind of doctor visit, whatever, and they picked up something while they were there. That's a healthcare associated infection. Workers, you guys, when you go to work, you could pick up something from your patient while you're in the hospital in a healthcare setting. And I'm like, that's a healthcare associated infection. And so it could be from any type of surgical procedure, from different personnel that weren't wearing you know, your PPE, um, different equipment. You could be exposed to drug-resistant microorganisms because there's a lot of them in healthcare settings. But about two to four million cases every year in the United States occur that people are picking up different infections because of going to the healthcare setting. It's a big reason why people are afraid to go to the doctor. There's a, I mean, who's there? Sick people. They've got lots of different organisms all in the same building. And I'm like, you're more likely to pick something up, especially if you have open wounds because of a surgical procedure. 
Now, this is showing a lot, you know, some of the different organisms that are picked up and where they get picked up. And so we, there's a lot of nosocomial infections found in the blood, the respiratory tract from those surgical wounds, the GI tract, your skin, the urinary tract, lots of different organisms that can get picked up from the healthcare setting. Now, to try to reduce that, we have universal precautions. These are measures to try to prevent the spread of these different healthcare associated infections. We want to stop the spread from patient to patient. We want to stop the spread from patient to worker, you guys, and we want to stop the spread from the worker to the patient. That if you would go in, you could be an asymptomatic carrier, but definitely don't want a worker that has the flu to go in and work with patients. They could be spreading it. So these universal precautions are there to prevent the spread of organisms between patients, between workers and patients. Because we do have to, you know, it's all based on the assumption that patient specimens could harbor infections. And so you just have to make the assumption that all blood samples and mucus samples, anything is infected. You have to make that assumption and treat it that way so that we are preventing the spreading of any kind of bodily fluid between patients or between patients and workers to stop the spread of different infectious agents. It's why you're required to wear gowns. It's why you're required to wear gloves, face shields, masks, is you have to assume that all patient samples are infectious. All right, so we got through a lot of stuff in this PowerPoint. So I'm glad you stuck with me to the end of this. Lots of terms, uh, but lots of things that you're going to hear a lot of these words in remaining PowerPoints, as well as we talk about specific organisms. Again, let me know if you have any questions on anything. Send me an email. I'll be definitely happy to answer it.